You see, a lot of people that know me from before, always, if, if people haven't seen me for a while, and then they see what's happened in my life, they can't understand how. Because a lot of people, when they want change, and they, they think they can change themselves. There, there's some ladies that take men that they think they can change them. It's like a fix-me-upper. The ladies know what I'm talking about. They, get to, they take a naughty boy, and they think, I'll, I'll fix this one. And then it doesn't happen. You see, it's, the fixing is in his presence. You see, I learned very early on to step into his presence. So the changing that I thought I wanted didn't happen by anything I'd done. It happened because every day I went into this place. And when you go into that place, when you walk out there, there's change. So every day I'd go into my office before I started work, and I would just stand there and wait for that place. Uh, we, you see, it's not by works. Jesus said that your works are like filthy rags. And when you go into a place of works, now get, there's a fine line here. Because there's stuff that I must fix in my life. When I say, I say we, we must fix. But it's when you take it to him that the fixing starts. You see, there's a, there's a sanctification where Almighty God starts to make you holy. He fixes you. He cleans you. Because if I did it, I could stand up here and say, look what I've done. I promise you, I stand up here and I say, look what he's done. It blows my mind. I don't understand it. Because the evil that was in here and here, just gone. If I have to tell you the thoughts I used to have, and the things that I planned to do, you'd run away. I can't even think those thoughts anymore. They're not part of my life. When a negative thought comes, straight away I run to that place. Because it still tries to come. And if, if you sit in here this morning and you have an issue, I promise you it starts with your thoughts. That's why the Bible says we must take our thoughts and put it under him. Not in him, under him. That means that has no place. He stands on it. So I don't know what thoughts you have in this morning. I don't know what place you're in this morning. But if you step into that place I was just in. I don't think there's a drug that can match that place. I'm glad my sister's here this morning. Because usually by the Sunday school... Who knows my sister here? You know her well, eh? Okay. Would you say she's a calm person? Sometimes. So the Lord gave me a picture this morning. To get to that place where I get to, because I know some of you are looking and thinking, I, I don't know if I can get there. And I don't always go there. Don't, don't get me like I'm living in this holy land, okay? But the time I get there, when I go to that place, is the time of desperation. Have you ever seen someone that's desperate? I'm not saying my sister's desperate, okay? One day I saw my sister do something that I never, ever expected her to do. Who's ever been to Turfentine Racecourse? Okay. So my sister's quite conservative. She's not loud. She will not shout. I've seen her angry once or twice. That's quite a, a funny thing, okay? But that day, we went to a charity event. Do you remember? I'm asking my mom. She's nodding already. I don't know if Sharon remembers this. And my sister bet on a specific horse. Oh, Pastor Kenneth, you were at the horse races. <laughs> and I saw her do something I never, ever thought I'd see her do. I was sitting at the back, at the top, and she went down when her horses were running, and she was doing this. <laughs> And screaming, go, go. <laughs> Never ever seen her do something like that. Guess what? She was so excited to see her horse win. She jumped up and down. 
And the Lord showed me that picture when I was sitting there. And I'm thinking, how many of you here, inside of you, you're doing that? But you're so conservative, I wouldn't want anyone to see me doing that. I wouldn't want anybody to see me so desperate for God that my little tears run out. There's men here inside. They are bursting with passion for Jesus, but because we've taught men, men don't cry. Cowboys don't cry. We suck it up. The little tear goes. <laughs> you see, when you're passionate about something, you do stupid stuff. I'm not calling my sister stupid. She'll clap me afterwards. But when you're passionate about somebody, think of what you'll do for that person's love. How crazy is the love for a man and a woman that they do stupid stuff? Crazy stuff. Do you remember, Dot? Crazy stuff. Phone calls, all these things. I want to tell the men something. Yesterday, it was about 110 women, 120 women. 140. They asked me, please stay. I sat at the back. Yeah, guys, I've got news for you. That woman that came here blessed the men there. She blessed the men because she told these women what their jobs are. Okay. If a man here has a problem with his wife, Bring, just come and see me. I'll sort her out. <laughs> because a woman told them, a woman told them what to do. I was so blessed yesterday sitting there. Because you know, over the last few weeks, I've been speaking about love, passion, sex, romance, all these things. And it was like she just came and finished it for me. Okay. She was so spot on. So I want to tell you this. God created us as passionate beings. We must have passion. Many times we suppress that passion in our married relationships because of that same thing that you sit here. You want to show that person how much you love them. You want to jump and shout for them. But you suppress that. You start to hide that. Even the men. Men, we're not supposed to be soft, eh? I'll tell you what. If you start being soft with your wife you'll have a, such an awesome life. Some of the men are like, oh, no. I'm, not, I'm talking about I can be a rugged man when I want to be, okay? I'm a man, I can do men's things. But when you're dealing with a woman, if you're not gentle and kind and loving and treat her like a lady, you ain't getting nothing out of her. Okay. Even what this lady told them to do yesterday, they'll do it for a while because they're waiting for a response. It's the same response that Almighty God is waiting from you. He pours out His love. He pours out His anointing. He pours out His passion on the cross. Remember Mary and Joseph. Joseph, the angel pitches up to Joseph and says, Joseph, thou shalt marry this woman. Joseph panicked. He said, but I didn't know her. I know her not. In other words, I didn't sleep with her. I didn't have intercourse with her. Jesus uses the same thing. When the people stand before him, he says, depart from you, workers of iniquity. I knew you not. I didn't have intimacy with you. Intimacy is the thing that makes you man and wife. If the intimacy is disappearing... Fix it. And if the intimacy with Almighty God is disappearing, fix it. Passion. Are you passionate? We hide our passions. Let's be honest here. Which one of you here can sit with your wife or your spouse? I know there's some single ladies in that. Maybe you've been divorced. I guarantee you never sat down with each other over a table and said, can I tell you my passions? My deep passions. Any, don't put your hand up here because you'll be inundated with, how do you do that? 
Have you sat with somebody and said, this is my passion for you? Have you told them everything? No, eh? Have you done that with God? Some go, I can tell you now, you are hiding stuff from Almighty God. He knows it already. What my sister spoke about this morning, he's all-consuming. He's everywhere, all the time, switched on, never switched off. Omnipresent, omnipotent. He means he is there constantly for you. You see, we, we, we have this idea that he's, because we say God the Father, we think of a, a natural relationship. He doesn't operate on that sphere. He operates here, heart and mind. He knows your thoughts. Can you imagine if every Sunday morning you walked in and you put your paper up, this is my thoughts for the week. This is the thought. Would you come to church? No. But he knows your bad thoughts and your good. That's how deep he knows you. That's what true intimacy is. You see, we've been taught intimacy is sex. You have sex, it's intimacy. It's not. It's not. Intimacy is knowing that person. That means knowing them spiritually, mentally, and then physically. And that's when you become one in the flesh. There's an intimacy that people can't explain. And I'm not talking just about running around and having whatever you want because it's fulfilling a lustful thought or, or desire. I'm speaking about knowing that person intimately here. I'm trying to do that with my wife. It freaks her out. Because I'm starting to tell her all my thoughts. Dorothy, are you listening? Sometimes she doesn't listen. Do you know why I'm doing that? Because Almighty God has asked me to do that. Can you imagine when you sit with your wife, this is for the men, and you tell her in the morning, this is my thoughts in the morning, boom. At nine o'clock, boom. At 10 o'clock. Do you know what will happen the first few times? She'll say, hey, you mull. She'll tell you you're mad. But after a while, she will start to trust you at a level that you cannot believe. Key to any relationship, trust. Take trust out. It's just a casual relationship. But when you trust that person explicitly because they are now telling you stuff that you shouldn't actually be hearing, it's exactly with Almighty God. Do you trust Him with your thoughts? Because He knows them. You can't hide them. And when you get the revelation of that and you start to understand that, your relationship with Him will change. You see, when the Bible says that he must become more and I must become less, I must be more like him. The Bible speaks about the refiner's fire. There's a baptism of fire where you pray and Almighty God comes. He says, boom, there you have the Holy Spirit and there's a burning and a, you just can't stop speaking about Almighty God. And some people speak in tongues. If you don't, don't condemn yourself. But then there's another one. There's a fire that comes that is a time of testing, a time of seeing who you really are. The picture the Lord gave me this morning was this. Imagine yourself in a cell with nothing. And it's just you. No cell phone. Because most of us are having relationships on this. Anybody that's got a cell phone is having many, many relationships. Way more than they had before this thing came out. And some of them are not nice. The event of Facebook has caused so many issues in marriages, it's just not funny. Because you'll say stuff on here that you'll never say face to face. Did you know that? So listen up. You're in this room and you're alone with yourself. Okay, it says a lot about the person, their ringtone. Eh? You're alone with yourself. Guess what happens very quickly? 
you start realizing who you are and you start understanding that a lot of the issues in your life that you blame other people for, it's actually you. When you spend time with yourself, without this stuff, without the music, because a lot of times when people are down, I'll tell them, listen, just go put your favorite song on and you'll pop out of that. The Bible says put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So when you're feeling heavy, you put on the garment of praise. But he was not speaking to an, uh, a nation or a world that had this stuff at hand. They never had a half hour, a CD or a phone there where they could put their song on. Put on the garment of praise. He meant that you must start to praise him. Can you praise Almighty God without a song? You can. The question is, have you? Have you just gone into that time where you just start to sing his praises? You see, I can guarantee you this. If you're battling with depression or oppression or loneliness or feeling you're not good enough, okay. <laughs> You have to go into that place where you find the song of your heart. When you just start to sing, holy, holy, holy. You might not even have a good voice. Who cares? When you find that place, you will find release in your life. You will find total release. I wake up whistling or singing. It freaks my wife out. Sometimes I just got to be quiet because she's still sleeping. I'm telling you now, when you start to find what is in your heart and you see that Almighty God must occupy that, your song will change. Have you ever been in love, Halman? And you wake up and you think of her, boom. And then there's that little song. Have you ever seen married couples? That's our song. When it plays, oh, they jump up and they want to dance. Anybody seen that? You need to find that song with Almighty God. You need to wake up to that song where you're singing praises to Almighty God. Your life will change. Anybody been in love? Young ladies? Have you got those songs? You got them, eh? Get the song of Almighty God. I don't know what it is. I don't know what song you need right now. But it might change. It might be a hip song. But when you find that song that is deep within your heart and you start to sing it, that is the garment of praise. People will come along and try and tarnish your garment with their stupidity, with their negative words, with evil thoughts. You have to keep your garment clean. You have to sing praises to him. That's what happened this morning here with me. I just started praising him and songs just started coming. I don't care if you liked it. I don't care if you thought it was too loud. I don't care if you thought it was repetitive. What happened was I found the song of my heart. And that word holy to me, people don't understand that word. Because the angels bowed down before the throne of God 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for eternity, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. If you can find that song in your heart, your life will change. What is your song? Can I ask the band to come up here quickly? My Bible says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives within me. If Christ is within me, I must have fullness of joy, fullness of peace, fullness of faith. Fullness of everything is within me. The question is this, has it manifested in your life? Have you realized who it is that dwells within you? Not how you feel. Don't trust your feelings. I'm saying that he is within you. If you've put your hand up one day and said, I need Jesus, you have the fullness of him. Because he says, whoever calls upon my name will be saved. But then there's another step that comes. It's the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And this is where so many people fall short. Do you know what happens? They're fearful. They're fearful somebody might see them. They're fearful they might cry. My sister wasn't fearful that day when she was jumping up and down because she wanted a horse to win. And that's what might happen the day that you ask the Holy Spirit to come and live within you because you want a closer relationship than you've ever had before. It starts here. You see, when you fall in love with someone, 
It starts in the heart. And then the thoughts start. So I want to ask you this question this morning. Where is Almighty God sitting right now in your life? Is it here? Not let's, go, let's not say is it. Is He here? Is it just thoughts? Or is you, are you so in love with Him? Is there a place in your heart that you burn and desire to, to read more, see more, speak more, understand more? What is the thing that consumes your life the most? What do you spend your life doing the most? If you're a drug addict, it will be drugs. Because that is what is consuming your life. Right now, that is your God. The thing that consumes your life the most will be your God. And if you're sitting there thinking, wow, it's my children, it's my husband, it's my wife. Think very, very clearly about who consumes your life. Because if it's not God, you've got a problem. So I want to do a song. I don't know if you've got a song. <laughs> I want the cry of your heart this morning to be, Lord, I want to love you more. I want to know you more. I need your love. I need your passion. I want to be just for you. When people see me, they must say, this dude is obsessed with Jesus. Everything, Jesus. Everything, Jesus. And when you get there, you see, the Bible says that we will come under persecution. If you're not coming under persecution, that means Jesus just a little bit of your life. But when you're obsessed with him, when you're over, you just consumed, people will start to reject you. Are you rejected for him this morning? Can we stand? Can we have the lights off? I want to tell you this. Almighty God wants to touch you in your heart, in your feelings, in your mind, in your passion this morning. But can you call on him? Can you open your heart to him? You see, if you've been hurt in your life, a man may have hurt you, a woman may have hurt you, I can tell you now you're going to find it very difficult to open up your heart to the Lord. But I want to challenge you this morning just to say, you know what, I give up. I give up, Lord, take it all. I give you everything. My hurts, my passions, my desires, my life. Everything. Father, this morning... I thank you for loving me, Lord. Yes. And if you can love me, Lord, how much more can you love these people in this place? So we praise you this morning. We give you glory and honor that you'd receive us, the sinners that we are, Lord. You'd come in and sanctify and set us clean and come and live within us even though we fail every day. We bless you in this place, Lord Jesus. We honor you. We love you, Lord. Father, as we leave this place, knowing that you are with us, consuming and loving us, thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.